Hey, 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 it's Shapo, we're back again. It's me, Matt, and Felix coming at you, and in a little bit, uh, Matt and I uh, will be uh, bringing you our first ever Oscar winner guest on uh, Chapo here. Very excited for that. But uh, before that, um, I think we simply must address something. We must address a person, a person who's no longer with us. I'm talking, of course, about Stan Chera. R.I.P. to are you, are you, are you feel God. I have just all week long, I've been feeling like Stan Chera, and I've been just racked with this like just deep seated fear that I will go out like him. You don't want to go out like Stan Chera. I do. I just, I, so many people in America have gone out like Stan Chera and it needs to be acknowledged. Stan Chera was an icon. Stan Chera had perfect skin. Stan Chera was unproblematic. Uh, Stan Chera always texted in the morning. Stan Chera was everything that you want a man or just a person to be. And now that he's gone, I feel this void in my life, and I don't know what to do. I haven't showered since Stan Chera has died in May. <laughs> I just love the fact that Trump now has his own personal Jacob Marley. Yeah, it's like when he got COVID and he was his lungs were filling with fluid, and he, like his life was flashing before his eyes. He saw Stan Chera floating with a bunch of chains around him and like beads yeah. poking out of his coat. Each one, each link I forged in life. <laughs> his brother died from it. Yeah, his brother. Like <laughs> yeah. people have probably seen me and my brother like have fun on Twitter, right? Like me, I I have a very good relationship with my siblings. Imagine if my brother Sam died of COVID, and then I thought I was dying, and I was like, "Oh no, oh no, <laughs> am I uh, am I gonna die?" You know, exactly like John Prine. <laughs> like, I like never met or do, like like and, and I used to think I, my first interpretation of the, the Sanchera thing was like oh he likes Sanchera more than his brother because his brother was a loser but actually like the more I deconstruct it the phrase going out like Sanchera it's like Oh no, Stan yes. Chera went exactly. out like he a, was a loser. He was He's a, loser. a bitch. He's a loser because Trump believes, like all Republicans believe, Trump believes that if you die of COVID, you're a bitch, one hundred yes. million percent. And so, even if he likes Stan Chera in the kind of vague way that he can like anyone, uh, he lost all respect for Stan Chera the minute he died. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> yes, and it's like dying means you're a loser. You've you lost the game of life. You've lost the game of life. Napoleon, <laughs> great general, one of the best. But he died. He's a loser. The stuff he did. <laughs> imagine the activities he did with Stan Chera. Like went to the world's most room temperature buffet with him. <laughs> <laughs> watched like watch 17 year olds ice skate at the plaza and like, yeah. ogled their asses. Fast forwarding <laughs> to the uh, dog fighting scenes from Iron Eagle together. <laughs> <laughs> and like a fucking awful, like moth it ridden yacht, they, drinking like yeah. fucking diet Fantas because they're both dry drunk. The, the, did you see the? I there's um an interview with him from like May or June where it's about how he started, you know, taking Corona seriously, and he goes, "I actually knew four or five people that died from it," <laughs> and he goes, "One, <laughs> one in particular, a great." Like perfect man, and that's perfect Stan, man. that's Sanchera. It has to a be a wonderful Sanchera. perfect man. I keep fantasizing about Trump, like uh, like you know, going out to uh, you know, on the on the balcony, like Mussolini, waving at everyone, and just like looking down the the National Mall and uh, just looking to the sky and seeing Stan Chera just in the clouds, <laughs> just beckoning to him, like like Easy E in the Crossroads video with Bone Thugs yeah. and Harmony. I'll see you at the crossroads, He's Stan. I was I was laughing about Stan Chera, and some right wing guy replied to me and was like, "Oh, you fucking lib, you, you think that happened?" And it's like, if one thing has happened during the Trump presidency, that's it. Yes, like that's yeah, the, no yeah. one made that up on Trump's yeah. behalf because the Trump is always able to outpace your wildest, realistic imaginings of what he could do or say. See the thing with the fucking Superman uh, T shirt, which means, and and that means that no one thought of Stan Chera. He thought of that. What, what, like, what of his, like, Ohogan Gidley or one of these fucking, uh, uh, fucking Dr. Seuss named assholes? Kaylee uh, McEnany. Yeah, like, goes, sc scrolls through his, like, his, uh, his Blackberry and finds a guy, oh, yeah, Stan Chera, and then, like, reverse engineers that bit just so that they could put it into the fucking week, the hill. No, no, he said that shit. No, he, he said, said I, am I going to go out like Stan Chera? He's, it's like, that is, 
that's so unlike Trump. It's so yeah. made up <laughs> that he would bring up some fucking 370 pound New York real estate <laughs> goblin Does anyone when he thinks he's that's dying. That's exactly have, what he would do. That's have, what he did. People have wild, have completely forgotten, and I remember this in 2016. His, his, his candidacy is remembered as this virtuous performance of white grievance, right? He played the American electorate like a fiddle, agitating all of their racial and gender and, uh, and, and uh, immigration related fears. To just echoing their anxieties personally in his own language. But a good 30% of every one of his sp- some speeches was about Carl Icahn and how he was a killer. <laughs> he's, a guy. he's amazing. He's a shark. We're going to put, put him in charge of the money. It's like no one on earth knows who that is, dude. What are you talking yeah, about? He was going in front of crowds of jug hooters and talking about guys <laughs> who ate scalloped potatoes with in 1987. <laughs> And they were like, yes, sir. Hey, yes, yes. You're as smart as Henry Kravitz, who I also love. I love, sir, I love, I love it when you, when you imply that you were at an orgy with every side character from Barbarians at the Gate. (laughs) (laughs) Holy Uh, fuck, that's a pull. James Garner. uh, Also uh, one of my favorite books. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, it's good stuff. Well, that I mean, and uh, Liar's Poker, the two best books about financialization in the 80s. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't want to leave him aside. Um, God has left him aside. But, you know, uh, Stan Chera, <laughs> you're, you're, I mean, Stan, Chera, Stan Chera lives. Stan Chera lives. Stan Chera has a posse. I'm going to start putting up street art all around New York about Stan Chera. <laughs> like, what do you Stan Chera is five foot five, very short. What do you think Stan Chera's life was like? Like, he was... <laughs> He was the head. He was like one of like in one of these like Republican organizations in New York, which is just like, I mean, that's like one step removed from just being the mafia. That's one yeah. step removed yeah. from like a construction job. Oh, he where was you've a never real, been he was the- a real estate guy. He was one hundred percent like a mobbed up dude, like doling out jobs to the fucking Soprano family. Mm-hmm. Uh, one hundred percent. Yeah, to, just. A guy who spent his days in air conditioned rooms eating room temperature lunch meat, as you said, having just like disgusting two minute encounters with prostitutes, golfing, yeah, and then dying like a bitch. Yeah, he was a New York developer who like just did like bullshit campaigns that are probably just money laundering activity for the Manhattan Republican Party. And so, yeah, his name. N- not his actual name, but he's probably obliquely referenced on like every Paul Castellano wiretap. As, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As like, yeah, you guys like, guy. yeah, as like the guy, the Jew, yeah. or fat yeah. man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Stan Chara aside, though, I mean, it's obviously we were we were all delirious last week uh, with with Trump getting uh, COVID and um, <laughs> being Walter Reed and then and spreading it to like half of the Republican Party. But they let him out of the hospital. You know, Dunstan checks into the White House and uh, he's uh, he's got a highly contagious disease. I mean, I, I guess like, I kind of sympathize with the doctors at Walter Reed because it's like he's the president. Yeah, exactly. But like but like, I mean, it's insane to me that they let him out of the hospital. And then like Trump just keeps saying I'm immune to it. He's and immune. I'm, I'm, he's, he's immune. immune. He was talking to uh, th- there was a really OK. So like. He's he's only on two feet and speaking right now because he is just what he is doped up on like highly experimental. He drugs. is hopped he keep, up on. Goofballs. He keeps he keeps talking about Regeneron. Regeneron. And, uh, that's <laughs> Regeneron not, that's is not the name of the drug. It's the company. <laughs> he is just doing a fucking pitch. He's like fucking uh, William Devane for Goldline. It's like, folks, I'm telling you about a wonderful new company. Regeneron. Regeneron yeah. is like is like. The, uh, the central item in one of those Philip K. Dick stories where you could tell he had given up. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think this is the greatest. Like, I love how like just the palette is so weird now, and especially the past two years, especially and this year, these two years especially, have been so weird that it's like the president probably eliminated thirty percent of his cognitive power with steroids. <laughs> yep, just and, it. Yeah, yeah. and he, and then he did a video looking worse than he's ever looked. Terrible on the lawn of the White House and his pitch to seniors, who he's just he's flagging with. He's like eating shit with seniors. Yeah, he's, yeah he's no, like, he saw those polls yeah. about seniors. And his yeah. pitch, he was like he turned to like all the Draculas that financed the Republican Party and were like, don't worry, I got this. And he's like, 
hey, I have vaporized 30% of my brain with steroids, and I am going to let you do it for free. <laughs> yeah. You, you also will be able yes, to put your... Yes. Do you see no, how that cool was awesome. I, he was like, you see how cool I am now? <laughs> you can be this way. <laughs> You will have a free opportunity to stick your head in a microwave like James and Condenza. Uh, Felix, it was like, uh, you, yeah, you said like uh, 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 doctors. Uh, it's wonderful. The wonderful doctors and Walter Reed. What a group. What a gang of guys. Uh, they've deemed the me, in their words, a, quote, medical moron. I'm, and would you like to be <laughs> like me as well? I'm giving you all these drugs for free. For free. And uh, it was like Felix, it, like the, you showed us that text. New story. Like, was They're it calling it flowers for Donald. <laughs> flowers for Donald. <laughs> he actually said in one of these. I think you showed us that text. No, Felix, you showed us that text. I think it was from like your mom or sister, and she was like r- riffing about how uh, Trump thinks Regeneron reanimates the dead, and he's like, <laughs> "We're bringing them all back. Yeah. We're bringing back Stanchero. We're going to Regeneron him. <laughs> was- Everybody who died of COVID, they're going to be here. Don't worry about it." <laughs> that was my mom talking about using Regeneron to bring back Stanchero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Felix's whole family is uh, very gifted, it's, folks. It's nothing but hitters. It's uh, it, it's the, it, it's maybe probably the best group chat I'm in. <laughs> The the other the other thing the other thing uh, he was there was a, a there was a, two very funny interviews over the past couple of days. There's one he gave with uh, Hannity, and uh, someone pointed out though that like when he first got out of the hospital, it was very telling that he was he was doing these uh, these like lo, lo, uh, sort of White House lawn videos. They were probably all shot one right after another, but he wasn't calling into his friends on TV. Not at so all. That's how you know he was pretty fucked up. But eventually, you know, I mean, he has he has recovered. Um, I don't know which God to thank for that. But um, uh, so, yeah, no, no, he, he was calling it to Hannity and then he would he muted himself on Hannity so that he could cough up half of his fucking lung. And then there was a, he was talking to Maria Bartiromo on Fox Business. And then he just says, like, he's just like talking about how good the Regeneron makes him feel. And then yes. he goes, uh, he say, he says to her, it's because I'm he's like, I don't know, I, I'm immune. I'm immune. He goes, it's be, it's. He goes, it's because I'm extremely young. He said, <laughs> a perfect physical specimen and extremely young. A perfect young. physical specimen who is extremely young. Folks, I'm that baby. Is... I'm baby. The, the Regeneron's made me a baby. <laughs> it's Benjamin Button. I'm Benjamin Button. <laughs> but just think about that. He said that. Imagine what hopped up on all the goofballs, the uh, zooted to the gill. Is imagine what he sees in the mirror right now. Like, what kind of vision does it's he, like, it's like, he caught by? It's like when Marge asks Homer if he has a drinking problem. And yep. she's like, do you drink to escape reality? And he's like, nope. Dude. And he's just yeah. flexing in the mirror. <laughs> he's, yeah. It, it, I'm a perfect physical specimen and very young. That is like a caption on like an e-girl photo. <laughs> <laughs> and the other really good thing he said and you're you're totally right though that i mean he he is aware of these polls that i've seen that show a huge shift away from him from people over 60 which let's be honest is the election that's all politics no, in america done for, they're, they're, done for. they're the only people everyone. who vote like the only people yeah that, that's everyone who matters at least as far as our democracy is concerned yep and uh he had another really good line in uh, one of the white house lawn videos where he was just like to our seniors our beautiful seniors you know Everyone keeps saying that you're vulnerable. Well, you're not vulnerable. Well, except maybe to this one thing. You're pretty vulnerable, but, you know, we're going to help you out. We're going to give you that. Yeah, he's just like, he's like, they keep calling you the vulnerables, but and you're he not. Actually, you're just he like me. He also said, I'm vulnerable, which is amazing that he ever said that. Yeah, the entire course. group therapy session cheered when he did that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a real breakthrough. He's yeah. doing CBT. And by yeah, that, that, I mean cock some, and ball that, torture. That's, that's <laughs> cool. That's some goodwill hunting shit. Yeah. Um, it's not your fault, Donald. I think the worst thing he could have done for his chances, I mean, it's a bad reflection on America and our politics and all of us, but the worst thing he could have done for his reelection was not oversee the deaths of 200,000 Americans. It was to give himself Corona and yep. it, because it made him look fucking <laughs> is stupid and weak and foolish yep. and like yep. a fucking mark. Like he, the all he did was talk about like how and, not know, wearing masks and like don't let it dominate your life, and it's like it's changed your life forever. <laughs> like you, you are never <laughs> going to be the same. You are fucked up forever. You were already <laughs> fucked up from like being addicted to diet pills, but this is the most fucked up you've ever been, and you're never getting out of this. And it, it just like it makes him okay, look apparently weak and foolish. 
well, not only have they checked him out of the hospital as he continues to just like he, he's walking around like pig pen in a cloud of fucking <laughs> virus particulate matter. But uh, no, apparently, according to according to news reports, he wants to do a live event, a, a rally every single day from now until Election Day. He's got to move that paper, which I mean, I think is great. Yeah, I think it's great. But you know what, though? I mean, obviously, like anything can happen. It, it, who the fuck knows what's going to happen on Election Day or, or what's going down? But I mean, if you just compare Trump in 2016, when no one thought he was going to win and he was just playing with house money to now, we're like, I mean, he's looking at the same polls everyone else is. And when you're when you're when you're not president, you can say the polls don't matter. But like he has been president for four years now. And it's just it's it's harder to have that to play loose. You know what I mean? Yeah. And what's he doing now? He's going into full whiner mode and he's getting mad that like Bill Barr hasn't indicted Hillary. He's talking about fucking Hillary Clinton in 2020. He's just like, Hey, Hey, remember crooked Hillary, everybody? Like i am playing all my hits. Would you like to get high like me for free? Would I'm you like to have my is, spectacular he, brain for free? He is looking through the, he's through the looking glass. He's looking through the prism of time because like time is bending around him because of how high his metabolism is jacked. And he is seeing 2016 in the mirror. And he's like, there, go back there. And, and everyone will, uh, that was good. That was fun. That was good. Yeah. But no, no, I mean, Hillary has tried her best no, but to they're, be they're, relevant. They're doing this whole Obamagate thing failed. now. Yeah. Obamagate is the most, it's the most boring Trump scene. Like, I I consider myself an expert on these things, on the Glenn Simpson and Nellie Orr stuff. And oh, yes. even I can't really tell you what Obamagate is. As far as I understand, it's about how Obama told, like, um, uh, fuck, what, Susan Rice to, like, put out a memo saying to wiretap Michael Flynn to make Donald Trump look bad so he would lose the election because everyone would know about the wiretap. But it's, like, clearly not in it. Like, clearly... I guess Obama. Why wasn't Obama. any of it released? Yeah, that's I, what I never understand. Like they just collected it and then let it win. I guess it, releasing it beforehand. I guess that Obama Gates kind of like it's the most realistic of these accusations against Obama and the deep state because it's like, well, if Obama was going to use the deep state to sabotage another president, uh, another candidate, it would be like it would be something where it's like. All right, so a year after he's president, everyone will find out about the wiretap. It will make him look so bad. I gotta we're still going to let him win. I got to say, this makes me a lib, but it doesn't really trouble me or my civil liberty spirit to imagine that the FBI investigated a guy running for president who is just gigantically in debt to various Russian fucking mafia figures yeah. that everyone knew about. It's like, then they say in the Comey rule, like, this guy might be a security threat. That's not that wasn't crazy to think. I'm not saying it meant that he was Putin's puppet, but from the point of view of being something like the Justice Department and you see this guy running for president and you see the people all around him. I don't understand. I don't I'm not horrified that the bourgeois state as such reacted that way. Yeah, I'm not even like you don't even have to go to Russia. You would notice like this guy did a complete 180 on his posture on Turkey and Erdogan within three months of them giving him like, yeah. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and it's right. Like, yeah, no, oh, that's maybe this guy shouldn't have a fucking clearance. Flynn I don't was th- yeah. openly doing crimes. He was like exchanging fucking money for influence as a, a goddamn general. It's absurd. Yeah, and it's like he got off pretty fucking light. Yeah, for he got, what he did happened to him. for what nothing he like everyone him. like that in DC. Nothing fucking happened to him. I mean, Flynn. I don't really give a shit too much about the thing that Flynn went down for, like the phone call to kiss because it's like, okay, he should have called him what? Three weeks later. Uh, I mean, like Flynn as NSA, he was better than Bolton, I guess, because just out of sheer corruption, Flynn was less interventionist and posture in a lot of cases, but he was still like shitty. He was still like a bad conservative NSA. Well, I mean, he was barely really even that, there. Yeah. He, he got the can almost immediately. Yeah. I mean, that's like a month later. That's the thing. Even if you agree with Flynn policy wise, he showed himself to be too fucking stupid, too fucking stupid not to get caught. And the thing is, is that like uh, I know there's a lot of people who edgily like to, you know, wrap this stuff up as like a a, a aha to liberals of like, ah, you guys were caring about uh, Russiagate made up Russiagate, whereas this was a real, uh, you know, violation by the government. And look, they, you know, leaked this to the press and that constitutes propaganda. I'm sorry. To me, these are mirror things. 
This is yeah, also a love of war yes. in bourgeois fucking politics. This is how capitalist parties and capitalist systems operate. There is nothing to be outraged about either way. It's fair ball. And like to care about it is to become care mad on behalf of what? The Republican Party and the personal ego of Donald fucking Trump, who just wants to get rid of the uh, asterisks next to his victory that's really there because of his own insecurity and the fact that he lost by three million votes. <laughs> yeah, that's the like, fucking asterisk. Exactly. But he can't get after that. He has to get after it by saying, although I would have won, I would have won if it wasn't for the dastard uh, Obama gay people. And so caring about that from the right position or even from some sort of contrarian populist position is just a mirror image of the libs clinging to fucking Russiagate as an explanatory mechanism I mean, that, doesn't, that doesn't require them to examine the deeper structural failings that led to it. Yeah, uh, yeah. And like, can you beyond just that one one skews left in defense of Trump or one skews right in defense of Trump and one skews left in defense of Hillary? Can you really find a tonal or any big difference in between the people who cry about Lev Parnas and the people exactly. who cry about Glenn Simpson? What's it's the, the difference? same it's, thing? It's impenetrable garbage. No one cares about. And that's the thing. The only thing this matters about the only way reason we're even talking about this is because Trump is making this his like end zone pitch. The last minute he's fucking whining to get away from what looks like from the polls a, an ass kicking. And he's grabbing it at these straws around this idea. Is it going to matter? And I say it's going to matter to normal people. The gonna, ones who are going to decide this as much as Russiagate does, which is zero. It's the mirror thing, which means it's it mirrors its uh, uh, electoral irrelevancy. No one gives a shit about Nelly Orr or Glenn Simpson or Lev Parnas or Yakov Smirnoff or <laughs> Beef Stroganoff, wherever the fuck these people are. Either way. He's whining. He's whining like Stan Chera did as he choked out his last <laughs> yeah. breath on a ventilator. Stan Chera actually went out like a man. <laughs> well, Stan Chera, Trump and Stan Chera were driving back from a sit down and Stan Chera crashed the car. Yeah, and then Trump put his, the like, just cupped his hand baby. over his mouth. Yeah. I was relieved when I found out, not because I was happy that Stan Chera died, but because I was afraid it would be you. <laughs> that was Melania. <laughs> <laughs> my nephew, okay, well, my nephew Stan Chera became a fucking liability. <laughs> Who knew if he was going to, this is going to be the day that he sells me out for a well done hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I don't. I don't want to spend all, all the first half of the show on Trump, but I, I do want to get to this this other thing uh, that is that has been very funny. This is a sort of uh, this is a scandal that sort of passed under the radar because uh, they're you know the, the president has coronavirus. But uh, can we talk about the the Cal Cunningham sexts that yes. may derail his side? Hi, 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 hey, Cab Calloway, candidate for Senate. Before we talk about these, can I, can I like jack off real quick? These are like too hot for <laughs> it's me. It's really hear. super hot. I, I like I the first time I read these, I had to completely throw out a pair of Adidas heroes. Uh, oh yeah, the, the strength of my pre cum soaking them burned through it like battery acid. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, this is a this is a really funny one because this is oh, like yeah. yet another politician sexting scandal in which there's no actual sexting nope. like the like the Alex Morse thing or yeah. you know like it's just politicians have such a weird they way of are being freaks. horny they are they are freaks they can't do anything straightforward which means even their sexuality is baffled by this system of like silly straw esque bends around like rules and ideas to get away from the abstract away from the actual carnality of the thing. They're all sickos. That's why they're in politics. It's axiomatic. This is the Cal Cunningham text reminded me of one of the last great Howard Stern bits, which was, uh, you know, look it up on YouTube. if It's still there. You listener. Uh, it's him reading the transcript. The um, God damn it. Mark Sanford love letters to his. Oh, yes. 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 The, same thing. And Howard said something that I thought was so funny where he's like, these guys like need a therapist to not sound like an asshole when they're horny. <laughs> and it's true because like Mark Sanford, I, I know everyone's probably sick of this, how often I've brought it up, but the two things that stood out in his letter to me were what he goes, 
I I, 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 w- I was, you know, hiking or rock climbing, and I thought of gripping on to part of you or two wonderful parts of you. <laughs> uh, and then, and then, you know, in his most like Tony or Christopher S said, these past few months with you have been a whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> I know I probably brought up whirlwind like 50 times since the show began, but it's my favorite fucking thing. Anyone said it's so fucking dumb so for a guy who <laughs> probably thinks so highly of himself. So, I mean, th- there is, there is sort of a twist to the scandal though. And I, I, I'm going to get to it, but uh, first, like here's some samples from, from Cal Cunningham's uh, uh, to texting with uh, the woman he's having an affair with, a woman named Arlene Guzman. Oh, I thought so, it was uh, Minnie the Moocher. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, yeah, uh, a Democratic candidate for North Carolina, Cal Cunningham. Uh, so this, this first, this is, this is Arlene. This is the woman he's texting with. She says, hey, I've had the most amazing dreams of our time together, and I'm thinking about you too. Happy belated birthday to Matthew. Cannot believe he's eight years old. He was so little when we met. He's like, dude, stop, bitch, stop talking about my kid. <laughs> <laughs> You're the side piece. No, he goes, thank you. And he goes, uh, would make my day to roll over and kiss you about now. Oh, You're yeah, sweet. baby. All right, he can goes, we get a You're content sweet. warning for this graphic <laughs> sexuality? I, would, I would, it would make my day to roll over and kiss you about now. And then Cal says, You're sweet. I would enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Sounds fun. <laughs> and she, and he, he goes, hey, uh, and you are historically sexy. Kiss face emoji every day and night. When can I see you? I want to kiss you. And then she goes, and I kiss back a lot. Oh, hell yeah. Damn. This is get away for an, shit. Get away for a night soon. The longer we wait, the crazier fall schedules will get. Yeah, no shit. I'm running for fucking Senate. In the, <laughs> in the spirit of... Oh wait, no. The uh, sorry. This is this is this is uh, this is Cal Calloway uh, saying he goes get away for a night soon. The longer we wait, the crazier fall schedules will get. In the spirit of I like what I like, quote on your adorable video. I operate under the I want what I want approach, and I want a night with you. Sounds these, wonderful. I this, want that too. Very this is, badly. It sounds like the lyrics from a fifties band called like the Groomsmen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. He is like old oh, sweetie baby. I, yeah. This yeah, is uh, yeah, this we're, is Gary Tasteman's oh sweetie this is baby. Gary Tasteman. Like yeah. we're like people. The Republicans that I keep an eye on, the Team Mitch guys that I keep an eye on. I knew. So you guys saw the poll that has uh, Cal up by ten, right? Yeah. No, he's up. He's above. He is. He is. Since this revelation, he has gone up three points in the polls. Yeah, well, I mean, I think people are just surprised to see a potential senator is, uh, da- is dating people over the age of 15. Honestly, yeah, it's like, <laughs> what's Tom Tillis's answer? Uh, hey, I keep all of my uh, trips to my Epstein plane secret, okay? Yeah, this is like, like the Republicans, I thought, I could tell they were worried about this because they were really trying to juice this. And oh, yeah. It, like, they were re- like, oh, look at what a bad guy he is. Like, L- like what do you guys do? like this is the most pg guy in either party like they are gonna bully him so much for being a fucking cornball uh compared to whatever moloch ceremonies with children they're doing like his they the republicans i follow they were trying to do like a like an, a seville style expose about this man like giving his letterman jacket to his mistress <laughs> <laughs> like everyone everyone in either party is just like f- flying to islands that that the cia wipes off of google earth so no one knows about them. <laughs> Do, like god knows what and the and this fucking guy is just like yeah he's having an affair but he's like yeah he's like um meet me in this safe house so we can share a malt yeah, he's standing out outside her window <laughs> with a fucking straw boater and a heliotrope bouquet. <laughs> like, like this guy probably fucking sucks. He's a Democrat in North oh, yeah. Carolina. Oh yeah, he's what awful. Do you think he's like he probably fucking blows. But like, as a guy, I you find this kind very of adorable. adorable. Yeah, it's more relatable than yeah. the reptilian blankness of most politicians. Yeah, yeah, dude. Could you imagine what Ben Sass trying to have an affair would sound like? What oh, a fucking God. horror show Jeez. that would be. Well, for, it would be for, like uh, th- opening the Necronomicon, looking at that shit. Yeah, imagine like, like what is Mitch McConnell's marriage like? Has anyone thought? Oh. Do you think he like at the end? Yeah, it's like, actually long- probably pretty lit. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they're you know, they're trafficking cocaine and fucking shipping <laughs> yeah, containers true. from China. You yeah, know, it's pretty they're, pretty sick though. They're on some Bonnie and Clyde shit. Yeah, but it's like the Mitch McConnell thing is an arranged marriage. I'm sorry. It just oh yeah, oh no. yeah, yeah. That's a dynastic. That's a dynastic union. 
one hundred percent. Bringing like, together revenue streams and yeah, across international borders. Mitch yeah, but what does he? Yeah, but what does he do for kicks though? Think about that. Ugh. That oh Jesus, God. that's Fucks, really horrifying. Honestly, they, literally they, a sex with turtles. I know yeah, it's hack, but yeah, it's the I only know. thing that I mean, makes like, sense. They, him just they, they like pencil him in for some FaceTime at the child zoo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tom, like Tom, Co- Tom Cotton, like look into that guy's eyes. What do you think? Like he gets to pervert heaven and can have anything he wants. What do you think it is? He like <laughs> it's something like oh. that. There isn't even a name for. It's yeah. like listen, I just I want like an Iraqi uh, tribal boy to stomp on my ass. Yeah. <laughs> Like someone feeds me birthday cake. Yeah, no, they're all like. I think it would be sort of sealed in one of those sort of latex breathing apparatuses. But like it's sort of like a it inflates, but it inflates with a diarrhea. And then and then and then (laughs) and then a boy does the Mexican stomping dance on you. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I think like at a minimum to be elected senator for the most part. You have to have sex like uh, Richie April. Yeah. <laughs> like at an absolute minimum. Minimum. Yeah. And it is loaded. It is yeah, loaded. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. gun is loaded. Yeah, the yeah. gun is loaded. No, they're like, these guys, all senators and shit, they are like Dr. Kennard from Hellraiser 2. Where in, the, in, the, in their office, they've got all of the box. They've got all the boxes. They've stored them. They're waiting for a moment when they can pass over to the other side and experience so, all all yeah, things. Yeah, and, 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 and regular. I want to clarify: regular congressmen aren't like this because regular congressmen are. Oh, they're the, dopes. They're no, just no, they're, regular they're, oafs, Buddy reg- Garrity style. Yeah, regular congressmen are the guys from their district who could not hold down a job doing anything else. Yeah, like they're, they're like, they're, and their kinky shit is like they they hire you know like a prostitute in in like a fifties brazier. Yeah, to yeah. like spank them with a paddle or something. Do you just re- like yeah. cartoon shit from like Dag like what Dagwood's boss would do? Yeah. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah. Do you remember Duke Cunningham? Oh God, yes. Yeah, Duke Cunningham. He was like he was like accepting millions in bribes. He was a real fucking piece of shit. It was so funny to see him go down. Oh, see hilarious! That fucking press conference. He where just like blubbered. <laughs> <laughs> um fucking piece of shit military industrial complex leech fucking scumbag sent millions of americans to die and suffer in war and austerity and everything you can name but when he got his millions from defense contractors he bought a boat yep. and he would put on the dukester yeah he would the put, dukester he would put on a turtleneck <laughs> yep. Like he would be like, this is like my getting pussy outfit. He would put on a turtleneck <laughs> and a silk robe and like pour champagne for these like poor hot twenty three year olds and be like, shall, it's like when, shall it's we like, get like into Alan... something more comfortable? <laughs> like what? you fucking loser. Like a, he was like Alan Partridge when he does the boating promotional video. That yeah. was his. That was his. I'm gonna get my fuck on uh, sort of a regimen. Yeah. So I said that there's a twist here though in the Cal Cunningham sex though. So. Uh, most of it is stuff like this. It's, it's Cal saying, well, uh, we'll make it easier for you. I have flexibility this month. Done with school, training, big RFPs, etc. So the only thing I want on my to-do list is you. And then she goes, sounds hot and so fun. And he goes, pick a day, a city, make up an excuse for the fam. I like he says for the fam. Oh, God. <laughs> says, make up an excuse for the fam, ditch a staffer, start your white shirt, and be ready to kiss a lot. Oh God! Get your get your get your smooching cap on. <laughs> your starch white shirt. That's the oh my! This makes like fucking great expectations look like max hardcore. <laughs> it is dainty as shit. Yeah. So okay, but like, but make an subsequently, for the fam, they, make an excuse for the culture. So I mean, yeah, these incredibly graphic texts about 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 having a smooch party with your with your with your steady girl, uh, sort of. But there, there, there's, a, there's a rub here. Subsequently, more texts have come out. And the texts are between Arlene Guzman and a friend of hers where she's talking to her friend about this affair. And the texts between her and Cal are like, you know, I, I want to kiss you a lot. Uh, uh, sounds wonderful. I would love to put my lips on your face. <laughs> but the texts from uh, the woman to her friend are like this. So she says, uh, she, she, so she's texting her friend and she goes, and this is what the politician sent me. Quote, you're going to be the best therapist ever at any rate. Sorry you're having to deal with it. Be strong. I know you are. On Monday. Haven't heard from him once since. Quite frankly, he doesn't deserve my pussy. 
Ooh. <laughs> oh. and, then, and then she goes, he's not even cute enough for me. Ooh. It's the power I'm attracted to, but it's dumb. I'm like a convalescent hospital for broken men. Make them feel better to be oh. with a hot woman, and oh, then they disappear, oh. LOL. I'm just going to send oh. his opponent his naked photos. That will teach him. Oh. Ouch. Oh, that Ouch. Generation. Everyone in this story is like, so fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, he's oh like, I, I, I love you so much. She's like, yes, you're hot and sexy. And then she's sending this shit to her friend. Everyone, she says, oh, he's, he's not even good looking. And, they, oh, and she's I, attracted God to the damn. raw charisma of what? Being a state senator uh, uh, or something from North Carolina? Yeah, you like yeah, you like that? You like how fucking wet I make you when you think about the parking lot tax break that I secured in the 2019 budget? Yeah. You talk like that? Your, yeah, you like talk that? about your franking privileges. So Yeah, uh, yeah, you like yeah, you like that I set up a means tested scholarship for UNC Chapel Hill? <laughs> All right, so uh, in another in another series of texts, uh, her friend her friend texts her and she and she says, uh, "How was your weekend?" And uh, she responds, "Spent avoiding Jeremy as much as possible." That's her husband, by the way. <laughs> and the friend goes, "Oh, that sucks. I totally get it, though." Guzman responds, "Trying to make plans to see the politician so I can give him the fuck of his life and walk away." <laughs> her friend goes, "OMG, ha ha ha! You're so silly. I get that." T- the friend, the friend is a bird brand. <laughs> You're the, so silly. The friend is Shamar Moore, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was FaceTiming her just like with his shirt off, like dancing, wearing a straw fedora. <laughs> then he goes, uh, the friend says, the best thing you can do is ignore him and he'll want you even more. And then Guzman says, something weird about fucking in another woman's house. Normally I would agree. He's so insanely busy. He wouldn't even notice. Friend goes, yes, he would. And then he goes, uh, last time I heard from him was Saturday. I texted him happy birthday and got, I want to unwrap you today. Only gift that comes to mind. Zero response since then. Block, kill, marry. Like, is he stupid or what? He knows I'm crazy, in parentheses, Latina, and can tank his campaign if I wanted to be a bitch. Latina stay winning. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. That is a, uh, just, a, just a bit of a keyhole glimpse into the uh, just just... I don't know, sort of heartbreaking and, and wrenchingly sad love lives of uh, people in power. I uh, There is, I have a second wrinkle to this story. Before the affair revelation, he did all his fundraising, Cunningham did all his fundraisers clearly in his house, in like a home office or living room. After, they've all been done in his field office. <laughs> <laughs> All his Zoom fundraisers. Uh, well, I mean, I mean the, wife, like I said, the wife's a trooper. The wife's like, fine. Like, yeah. She's rightfully so going to divorce him. Because this is sad. Like, I felt bad for the wife because it's one thing. If your husband, your your state senator husband is texting some woman like, you know, I want to put my head up your asshole and scream. <laughs> like, let's put on Zentai suits and fucking sniff each other's piss. That's like... <laughs> I feel like you can work through that because it's like, okay, he had something weird he had to get he out. He had some of. itch that he yeah. needed to scratch. But when, it's you like, know? when it's like, you make me the happiest boy in the world when I think about <laughs> kissing you. It's like he loves her. He doesn't love you. Yeah. That means he does. Like, that's well, I feel like, sad. I feel sad for him. That was the... That was the funny thing about the Mark Sanford love letters is that I like I almost felt I mean I he's an evil piece of shit but I almost felt bad for him because what was clear to me in the letters is like the guy is like what in his fifties or something and like he's this is like the first time he's ever like really been in love with someone no yeah all these it's, guys, it's really sad all these guys like their first like serious adult relationship when they're like twenty four they're like all right I need to like I need to have like three kids by the time I'm thirty like let's let's get it yeah. going like these are all the same fucking robots. And they're like, they never sort of evaluate a person for how much they love them. They just like look at a woman. They're like, how would she look at a podium? And it's like, it sucks for them. It sucks for the woman. It sucks a lot for the kids. I feel worse for them than anyone. But uh, yeah, they don't, they don't really know what love is as an adult until they're like 62. And And then, yeah, they're like 60 and talking like a guy who's like 15. It's insane. It's it's so fucking funny. Yeah. But yeah, no, he's, uh, I mean, like, you know, it's like by the time you're that age, though, I mean, like, you know, if you're having an affair, it should just be like, you know, stick to the basics, buddy. Yeah. Just well, yeah, I mean, a, 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 a date and a, and a hotel room. Like, you try like to get three the pipe? upon a head of time. I like an affair. I feel like 
the guys who have the more like disconnected affairs, it's usually Republicans. Oh yeah. Uh, but because well, they're uh, but, so used to compartmentalizing like whole just chasms of their personality yeah, they're like away Tony from Soprano. like. They're like Tony yeah. Soprano, and there's this. They have this. They don't really have a if, guilt. If Tony Soprano was gay, yeah, <laughs> go on. <laughs> but the Democrats, I mean, I think they're attracted to the corniness of the affair. Like an affair that you care, an affair that isn't just sexual, is fundamentally. I've said it before. It's fundamentally corny, and you can get obsessed and lost in the corniness because, as an adult, most corniness that you engage in. They're like necessary acts, their family obligation or their social obligation or work obligation. They're having to show enthusiasm for something you don't have. Sometimes they're like just the part of the endless parade of soul crushing things that you do at, at, when you're past your late 20s. But an affair, like an emotional affair, is like the last corny thing you can do that's for you. And I think the Democrats mm. like. Because their life is all these fake enthusiasms and bullshit and they, yeah, go out every day. Like, you know, a guy who is a fucking Marine officer for 10 years, and then a management consultant goes out and goes, uh, hey, hey, every, hey, everybody, uh, like, like the, the Jake, uh, Oshenslaus guy. The guy who trained Panamanian oh, death squads yeah. talking about indigenous oh, states. God. Talking about indigenous states. It's like, you don't believe it. Like, you have more bodies of indigenous people than anyone. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's just all this bullshit that they pride themselves on playing the game, on doing the act, on... They think, they're, they think, <clears throat> they think everyone is dumb except them because they're the ones lying to everyone. But then they get this one thing where it's like they have unambiguous, pure, personal corniness. And I, I think the sex is totally secondary for them. I mean, Anthony Weiner clearly had a complex, right? Oh, Where God, yeah. He, he didn't he, want to have sex. He, he just wanted, wanted to have weird boner-inducing text conversations. But I think he liked the element of, like, being desired and novelty and, like, the, the, the hunt of finding someone and someone hunting you in a way. And, yeah, it was sexual to an extent, but it wasn't, like, there's a reason he kept doing it without fucking anyone. And it's there's a reason all these guys do this shit. There's a reason why all the everyone kind of does it. Like most Americans, like their marriages don't last. It's a very popular thing to do. I don't know what it is about American life that it's like, yeah, maybe the, maybe maybe I'm right. This is the last non corny thing you can do in adulthood. <laughs> I know. I think that's I think that's a very good point. Actually, it's a. This is this has been Mr. and Mrs. Erotic American <laughs> and Paul Harvey. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, just um, I, I know I've said this on the show, like like like, like what is it? Uh, a wor a whirlwind uh, a tour of whirlwind. emotion. A whirlwind. Uh, my favorite, my favorite uh, horny texting though is still by far uh, the Mark Foley scandal when he was oh, texting yeah. those teenage pages, and then he asked one of them, "Are you horny?" And he says yes, and then he just goes, "Cool." Are you horny? Cool. <laughs> That's a cool his were that amazing to me is the best one yeah his were amazing because it would be like it was like you're if he, he wasn't who he was like you're going to prison like <laughs> it's like you can't say that to like a 17 year old but he like yeah he's like risking if he's not a congressman he's not a well-connected dude like a gas price sentence for what he's doing and he gets these messages like and he's just like rock on <laughs> it's like a, like a fucking like fifteen year old, but like this could ruin his entire life it, beyond measure. It could wipe his name, like this important guy who strived his whole life for it. It wipes everything out, and yeah, this seventeen year old who he's psyching himself out over. It's like yeah, I, um, I'm horny. I guess he's like you, the man. <laughs> <laughs> like no, what I a feel like fucking loser. <laughs> I, I think you're totally right, though, that like Democrat or Republican, like these guys like have all wanted to be president since they were 12. So like every relationship that they've sort of forged in their personal lives has been sort of against that crucible. And I don't think like I think they discover like like late in life, like what their own actual desires and, and personality is like. Like, you know, like, like like Pete Buttigieg is a perfect example. Like these guys just like they choose their spouse for like central casting reasons, not because they 
especially turn them on or fucking, uh, you know, have some sort of deep relationship. And then like, you can only defer that shit for so long. And then I, I think what you said is very, uh, very true that like having this kind of corny emotional fear is like at, at, by that age, the only thing you can do for yourself. And it comes out in uh, very funny ways. But honestly, I do feel sympathetic with Cal Cunningham. I mean, you know, I, I, to have, you know, his embarrassing text messages read on a podcast like this one. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it's just his political career is a, a billion times worse than anything he's said or done to his wife. Yeah, I mean, and he's he's going to win. He's probably going to get divorced, but I don't think that marriage was long for this world anyway. If he was just Cal, you know if he was just Cal Cunningham, the lawyer in the Salem area that marriage is still ending within the next five years and i guess uh kudos to the voters of north carolina if they just like they're just like yeah who cares yeah in fact, well, this makes me like him more this is the best part is that so he, he went up in the polls but he did go down in two segments he went down among older people who i guess still have a sense of propriety an old-timey unreconstructed uh social propriety that they ignore in trump's case probably but whatever um and women you know who imagine themselves being cheated on by this guy but he is up among young people and men yeah, <laughs> Huge all, rock. all those people who moved to north carolina to work for defense contractors or you know biotech or yes or pharmaceutical, absolutely research whatever. triangle yeah, motherfucker yeah people who pride themselves on having a you know human rights campaign bumper sticker and just contribute to human misery 14 hours a day six days a week and yes. are just you know, pulling down huge wads of cash for it, still think they're good people. Of course they see themselves in this. The old people are funny because the way, I mean, if you heard about any of your grandparents having affairs, they're pretty funny. They're always one-offs. Your grandpa, yeah. your grandpa, you know, he fucked like the cigarette girl at the dog track. And, so he, <laughs> uh, and he had to like buy, buy, and she was like 15. And that was, you know, cool to do in 1951. But his wife, course found out and you know he had to buy your grandmother a neck a, a, a seven pound diamond necklace for 47 dollars which was half a <laughs> year's pay but no they were one out like whatever i hear about like you know older people heavy it's a family shame to have them run away with the woman right or the run yeah. away with the man but usually it's like one one off one and done you know like i saw I, yeah I, I i saw the ham and cheese girl at the <laughs> Fucking, you know, wherever. I don't know. I was watching Nelson Rockefeller give a speech to the <laughs> pipe fitters union, and I just had to have the girl who was selling ham and cheese sandwiches. <laughs> and you did, they just never see her again. And then, like, on their deathbed, they're like, I was in love with her. And it's like, okay, shut up. You're dying. <laughs> but that's their life. That's it. That's one. That's, that's, that's it. it. That's what Stan Chera was thinking about when uh, he shuffled yeah, off the well, coil. Yeah, St- Stan Chera probably, like, I mean... I don't want to speculate too much about the type of guy Stan Chera was, but uh, <laughs> what can you say about a 77 year old real estate man who died? Yeah. A, in, an obscenely rich Manhattan real estate developer who was friends with Donald Trump. I bet he had some wholesome. Oh, Cunningham. well, yeah, yeah, he had a, yeah, he had a, yeah, his, his, his memory reel playing as the DMT hit must've been like a fucking, must've been like Hellraiser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we should, uh, let's, uh, let's move into the second part of the show. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I stopped at a, for gas, and uh, there were three gas stations and about sixty motorcycles at these various gas stations. No one wearing a mask. It was very, it was very Trumpy, and they had a Trump mem- memorabilia stand set up outside the Wounded Knee Massacre uh, Memorial Museum. Ouch! Ouch! Good oh, lord! Oh, fuck me! Yeah, that's bad. Classy, right? Classy. Keep it classy. The funny thing about that that Sturgis rally, aspired from being a uh, uh, that Smash super Mouth spreader event. <laughs> super spreader event with uh, featuring Smash Mouth, I think the funny thing about the Sturgis <laughs> Basically thing, like if Typhoid Mary went to uh, Splash Mountain, <laughs> it was like a like the Sturgis rally. By now, though, is just all these kind of like weekend hobbyists, like these guys yeah. like taking their hog in a trailer to the, the Badlands or whatever. These guys are all like the retired dentists, you know, one hundred percent. And they no, all and they all guy. love and they all love law enforcement, which is really going against. Against the uh, the sort of outlaw biker thing, which you know, I mean, it started out. I mean, if you were a biker, it was because you were like selling crank. You were you were killing local law enforcement, not uh, kissing their ass. Yeah, I just like the idea of Marlon Brando from the the Wild One rolls into town and past the the old Barney Fife cop standing next to the soda shop and goes, "Thank you for your service." <laughs> 
Yeah. It was uh, it was uh, the moment the the moment in the trip that that, that I made across country that was most uh, illuminating for me about what was going <laughs> on. I guess I'll, I'll kick things off. Um, it's Shapo coming at you. It's uh, Will and Matt here, but we have a, uh, a special guest for you. Uh, you may remember him from such films as Arlington Road and Brian De Palma's Mission to Mars. It's Tim Robbins, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for I mean, having me. You're, you're laughing, Tim, but I just rewatched Mission to Mars not too long ago, and it's a fucking masterpiece. It, it's amazing. It's a totally underrated movie. Brian De Palma. Uh, I mean, yeah, Brian, De, the, the great one. I mean, yeah. shit. Uh, spoiler alert, the scene where you pop off your helmet to kill yourself and save your wife, Connie Nielsen. I cried during that, dude. Did you really? I mean, I not really, but you know, I was feeling it inside. <laughs> as, much, <laughs> as much as a podcaster can cry. Right. You we thought, well, if I did have that emotional connection, I would cry. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like the Terminator. I was like, now I know why you cry, but it's something that I can never do. Um, well, Tim, I want to I want to kick things off uh, with a with a with a news item from this weekend that I think will uh, very nicely segue into your current project. Uh, this is this is courtesy of the New York Times. Uh, this is covering the headline here is uh, Trump makes first public appearance since leaving Walter Reed. And, you know, the whole article goes through, you know, the fact that he's uh, he's immune to disease now and he's very young and feels like a baby thanks to uh, the wildly experimental steroids he's on. Yeah, they uh, had him uh, in a vat of spice melange for two weeks. <laughs> but uh, it had it had this uh, incredible paragraph. It says here in several phone calls last weekend from the presidential suite at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, Mr. Trump shared an idea he was considering. When he left the hospital, he wanted to appear frail at first when people saw him, according to his people with knowledge of the conversations. But underneath his button-down dress shirt, he would wear a Superman T-shirt, which he would reveal as a symbol of strength when he ripped open the top layer. He ultimately did not go ahead with the stunt. So, uh, <laughs> Tim, I got to ask you here, uh, how infuriated are you both that he was stopped from doing that, but also that you didn't have the idea to, for, for that to happen? I well, God, I wish he would have done it. You know, I, <laughs> I, it, I, I um, think the person who talked him out of that should be prosecuted for treason because they've absolutely. robbed us of what probably are, like the what, best moments since the Gettysburg Address. It's like it's not going to matter. It's not going to change a single vote or anything. You're just depriving us of entertainment just out of spite. Awful. Just disgusting. Remore. Yeah, he's a um, boy. He's a showman, right? He's you yeah, know, he knows. Yeah, he knows. Uh, he knows what to do. Yeah. And he's now apparently immortal. So, I mean, he wasn't, in my opinion, it's amazing he's alive anyway. And now that he's alive after COVID, after they filled him with radioactive ape blood, <laughs> they they put him on like the clean and the clear regimen that Barry Bonds had. And he was like having conversations with Roy Cohn. And now he's back better than ever. I don't think he can be killed by conventional weapons. He, we, this is the superhero we've been waiting for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, when I was writing Bobo Supreme, I, you know, you have to go to those kinds of um, uh, realms to imagine what this uh, unbridled id is, and you know, what is what are in the dark, deep recesses of this twisted psyche. You know, what is his dream life? What is what 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 does he imagine himself to be in his dreams? Well, I mean, a, a, a very a very good a very good man and a great president. A wonderful. Yeah. Some, some are saying the best and the greatest, and we're hearing it more and more. Many actually, well in Babo Supreme, he's always a sports hero. Yeah, sometimes. yeah. He imagines himself as a you know an incredible golfer, a boxer, a, a, a basketball player. He's he, he's always uh, you know. Uh, achieving great things on on the athletic field. My favorite moment was when he 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 had to like let it in, let out the secret that he's a senior citizen. He's saying to my favorite people, the seniors, you might not, you don't know it, nobody knows it, but I'm actually a senior citizen, and maybe you don't want to, maybe, and then most amazingly he said, maybe don't tell them, like we'll keep it a secret between us that I'm a senior citizen. Amazing. Yeah. It's like yeah, I'm just like you. I mean, how could he? I, I see that man like the giant rumpled uh, box of clothing, and I'm like, he's definitely uh, under 70. 
So yeah, I mean, you you're, you do the, the, this the, the the podcast you're doing now, Babo Supreme. I mean, thanks thanks for entering the uh, the, the crowded uh, podcast field already. You are now Come our on. enemy. Yeah, yeah. We, we, yeah, we will destroy I, I you after you. this. Uh, now that you're trying to get <laughs> you're trying to get that 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 Patreon bucks. This is our racket. We'll be taking. We'll be just let us wet our beak, Tim. But uh, I, I just like when I was listening to it, I, I thought back to uh, another project you did, which was uh, during the uh, the Bush years. You you wrote and performed in a, a play called Embedded, that was sort of a satire of you know like the the media and the Iraq War, but also these sort of uh, Straussian neoconservative wizards who uh, dream this all up. And you talked about sort of channeling that id, trying to get into that psyche. And I guess like just artistically or satirically or psychologically, like what do you see as the differences or maybe similarities between the, uh, like the neocon uh, crime family who did the Iraq war and now like the, the MAGA right wing and uh, their, their avatar and Supreme leader Trump. Well, the neocons were a lot better at hiding uh, their true agenda. They were, they were a lot better at image uh, making. Trump is just uh, naked in front of us, showing us exactly what he is. And so are the people that are enabling him. Uh, in a way, that's uh, maybe healthy, that uh, it's, it's uh, illuminating a truth uh, that um, is, is, we've all suspected and that uh, they've been able to hide in the past. And um, they're both um, capable of great harm uh, to the country and have done great harm to the country and to, uh, to, to um, the future, uh, particularly in the environment. Um, when I did Embedded, uh, you know, it was a huge hit at the public theater, but we didn't get one good review from any of the, uh, the outlets in New York City. Uh, in fact, one of them, the, in the New York Times Review, they accused me of making up this thing called the Office of Special Plans and uh, accused me of being a conspiracy theorist. And, uh, you know, there were all kinds of um, ways they tried to discredit that uh, thing. And But we would have the journalists that had just returned from Iraq come and do talkbacks with us at the public theater. And they were attesting to the, the, the fact that the play had more truth in it than most uh, most news outlets at the time. Pretty rich of the New York Times to accuse your play of making up something about the Iraq War. <laughs> well, particularly the Office of Special Plans, I guess the, that critic just wasn't aware of the fact that that actually existed. Yeah, that's one of the problems with trying to communicate a lot of information to people is, is that the hor- things are so much more horrible than you know your baseline day-to-day understanding of the world is that it's hard to assimilate. There's famous uh, difficulty in polling uh, and in campaigning against Republicans that's been borne out in uh, focus groups is that when people are read uncontroversially re- Republican policy positions, they don't believe they're real. They don't believe that, 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 the, that they would actually have that as an agenda, and so they just distrust the person telling them instead of accept that that's what Republicans think. But isn't that uh, Trump's genius is that he knew from the start that he had to subordinate truth? Uh, so he, he he immediately started um, saying that everything about him that was being written or said was just a lie. And, um, you know, this is right out of the the playbook of Mein Kampf. This is the uh, the big lie. This is the, you know, which we which we uh, use in Baba Supreme. Um, uh, his wife reads Mein Kampf to him to get him to go to sleep. Uh, it's kind of like a, a bedtime story for him. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, I kept it next to his bed. I like to think that instead of reading it, he would just imagine that sleeping next to it would allow it to osmotically enter his mind. Well, as he says, you know, I've never had more intellectual dreams in my life than when I was reading mine. So, you know. <laughs> I mean, it, it, this is the, it's, this is where we are, right? This that we that we have a president that is um, willfully embracing uh, fascist tendencies. But the reason why uh, we have to do satire that is uncompromising and that that uh, dares to offend. And um, I don't believe in polite satire. I don't believe in parody or imitation. So that's why we wanted to create a, a, a character uh, that was not exactly Trump. We we needed to go into this the realms of the psyche that that is unexpressed. And that's f- fun to do as a writer. You you have to imagine what it's like when all the cameras are off and. The, uh, there's no one around. What what is that person? Who is that person? 
I mean, you bring up uh, political satire, and um, before you came on, uh, Matt and I were talking about uh, another film of yours, uh, Bob Roberts, which is you know one of the most prescient political satires and you know recent American film. But the thing is, like, you watch that movie now, and it's like we're living in it. So, is it hard to do satire when like satire has caught up to reality? Like, there's it's almost like there's nothing left to make fun of because like there's no. There's no there's no one step of removal to like just like make make it go that extra bit of absurdity or hyperbole. Like is it is it hard to like to do a satire about Trump when like he is as you said everything he appears to be? Well, that's why you have to go further. That's why you have to go uh, uh, to extremes with with the behavior of Babo Supreme. Uh, he he, you know, for God's sake, he he tasers a clarinet player for playing a B flat. You, you you just have to let your imagination go and say, what is the unbridled id? What is the unchecked Ubu the king in this guy? The uh, the surrealist character from 1900 that kind of redefined what theater was and what cr- would lay the road for surrealism and Dadaism and expressionism, you know, this kind of the courage of that particular performance that that happened in Paris, you know, 120 years ago, where the audience was so offended, they ripped out the seats of the theater and threw them onto the stage and had a riot. I don't know if, if you noticed, but, you know, on we released this on Thursday, you know, in this in Baba Supreme, uh, there is a uh, takeover by a, a white uh, supremacist uh, militia of the Michigan State House. And the day we released it, uh, the news broke of that militia group in, in Michigan with that intent uh, to take over the state house. So um, we're we're so far uh, batting a thousand on our uh, prognostication here. And uh, by the end of Babo Supreme, you'll see uh, it, it, it winds up on Election Day. And what happens on Election Day um, is... Uh, what I fear is going to happen on election day. I don't want to give anything away, but uh, it's pretty close to what uh, the signals that uh, are that uh, Trump has been sending out. I mean, like, you know, it, it is the, 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 the podcast, this is sort of a, a radio play and it does have a, 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 you know, a sort of Mercury theater feel to it. Like, you know, an Orson Welles uh, war of the worlds kind of thing. Um, did like, yeah, like, did you, did you, were you conscious of that? This kind of, uh, this throwback medium of the radio play when you were doing it? I was in particularly the Mercury theater because of the content, uh, you know, at a time when fascism was on the rise in Europe, they were doing, uh, that's why war of the worlds was so, uh, successful is because people had the anxiety already, of uh, fascist invasion. And so everyone's, Everyone was living it with this anxiety. And so that's why it created this kind of panic. Um, and also because of the way they did it, it sounded so real. Uh, this uh, Also, uh, they did Julius Caesar, which is uh, very reflective of that time as well. It's um, I think the big challenge uh, in entertainment right now is to try to reflect these times, acknowledge them and be humble in front of that. And to know that, the old paradigms won't work anymore. They, that, that it, particularly at this time, we have to figure out a way to tell stories that are relevant and resonate with this time period, um, which is why Babo is, is, is um, I feel a, uh, is, it, it, it has to have that edge of danger to it. And aside from being funny, also has to have a, a core reality that is close enough to be terrifying. I mean, like, you know, it, it is the, 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 the podcast, this is sort of a, a radio play and it does have a, a, a sort of Fuhrer in the bunker quality to it as a, you know, an election approaches and a pandemic ravages the country. But like, you know, what <laughs> I mean, it's it's too perfect that the reality that you're making fun of just keeps getting funnier and funnier. I mean, it's almost unfair to you, like the you know, Babo slash Trump getting COVID. I mean, how have you have you been appreciating how good his brain has gotten on experimental steroids? I I I don't appreciate anything <laughs> about him. <laughs> I, I I I I recoil in horror. Um, you know, the, the, that thing you read from New York Times, I want to first appear weak. 
um, you know, at times I, I felt there was some acting going on when uh, he got out of the hospital. Um, who knows uh, what the real truth is? I mean, I, I, I've long ago given up on the idea that we're going to get the real truth from uh, news reports. Uh, you mentioned the uh, like appearing weak thing. I mean, like that's the classic, uh, the James Brown move, right? Where he would like sort of hobble off stage and his, his, his sort of backup man would put a, uh, like, a, like a blanket over him and then he would just spring up, throw it off and do another four or five songs. I mean, you mentioned that, you know, he is, he is a showman and that, like he's a showbiz personality. And do you think that that plays into uh, sort of the, the inability of, uh, of people or, the, the journalists or sort of liberal satirists to, to sort of fully metabolize and sort of get over on Trump because he is such a, a showbiz creation that he sort of has these antibodies to like traditional means of stitching up a politician or, or critiquing I, them. I think where um, maybe comedy is falling short right now is that uh, it's not imagining the, or projecting the worst yet you know um i think the whole purpose of satire is to try to f illuminate a truth that we kind of know is there but no one's saying and um that was at the ambition with with babo the the good news about doing a fiction is that you don't have to be completely accurate you can use your imagination to fill in the gaps and and project about what it would be like to be witnessing this person behind closed doors what is that damaged psyche what is that unbridled child that is in there that 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 i need everything right now as he says in one of his songs uh my daily mantra uh is what is yours should be mine the 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 two-year-old's uh perspective on life with without a uh a person that has not a child that has not reached the age of reason. Uh, yeah. I mean, he, he, he does, he is a person. And I think like the, you know, obviously uh, this pandemic that we're all dealing with right now is, 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 is a vivid and terrible illustration of this, but I mean, he really does seem like a guy. I mean, if you ask the question, like what is there is, is someone who doesn't really regard any other person as it's really alive or, or, or in so much as that they can like service his needs or will, but like the other people just essentially don't exist and don't matter to him. That's a two year old. Yeah. I mean, just imagine that. So, so right from that perspective, what, you know, what, what is, how would a two year old be the president of the United States? I mean, that sounds like it would have been a great eighties movie and I'm sad we never got it. President baby. <laughs> you're, I mean, you're a guy who's sort of, uh, attempted to you sort of weave together your own, you know, personal political views that are often, you know, uh, land on, uh, let's just say, less than receptive audiences, If you're whether you're talking about, you know, the president or, you know, Hollywood studio executives. I mean, like, you, you've been for, like, decades now, like, one of the more outspoken of the, you know, the, the Hollywood celebs, and you've gotten quite a lot of stick for it. I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, you, you've been, like, a sort of, you and Michael Moore have been, like, you know, a favorite target of uh, sort of angry wannabe celebrities and right-wing pundits for a while now. Like, do you, I mean, are you aware of that when you, uh, tr try to like you know to speak on a political issue or to uh, create a work of art with some sort of political valence in it. I'm aware of the idea that there's not going to be a lot of support from either side, um, uh, but in particular, the people that are going to attack are. Um, I'm, I'm long ago. I have understood what that is. It's really just um, a way to try to intimidate others to be quiet. Um, it really isn't based in any kind of real thoughtful criticism. It's based in shut the fuck up. You know, it's very easy to hate in the abstract. You know, when you're behind a keyboard in a dark room, it's awfully easy to be uh, courageous and say awful things to people. But I, I really, I've always viewed it as an abstract. When I came out against the Iraq war, as you remember at the time, it was, um, you know, it was very intimidating. The, 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 everyone was moving in in lockstep on this uh, on both sides, and so uh, I remember thinking, "Wow, you know, it might be dangerous out there." And 
I lived in New York City at the time and not one person said anything negative. And then I, then I took a trip to San Antonio to the final four with my sons. And I figured, well, it's got to be there. I'll just buck up and deal with it. Not one person in this sporting event said a thing. I think it's an abstract thing. I think it's unfortunately gotten more and more real over the past few years. I think more and more of these people are feeling empowered uh, to express their racism, their bigotry, their ignorance. That's unfortunate. I hope it doesn't reach a critical mass where it becomes something that is violent. Um, I, I, but you do see that starting to happen. And um, that is because of the rhetoric. And, you know, listen, we haven't never had a president that has just flat out encouraged that kind of rhetoric. Uh, usually it's, it's, it's coded. Usually it's uh, um, dog whistles. Now it's a full on bark. It's it's predictable the the reactions of uh, the right wing to you know and art in general, but you know certainly any art with a left wing point of view. But what about what about liberals? Because you know I mean like you you've staked out some political positions and like you know arguing from like a, a left wing point of view often puts you across purposes with uh, what is what you know the more comfortable sort of you know artistic you know liberals love art and they love movies and entertainment and things like that. But if you step on their toes, they squawk too. I mean, I'm uh, wondering like how, what's the difference if if any in your mind between sort of liberal and conservative uh, outrage? Uh, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's disappointing. Um, let's put it this way. Bob of Supreme is completely self-financed. <laughs> I went out and tried to get some help, but there was none there. And, uh, you know, it, it, so in other words, I wasn't encouraged to do this um, by, uh, by people that uh, are the gatekeepers. Um, I think I've just accepted that, you know, that I, I, uh, we're living in that reality and, um, hopefully, uh, that will change. I haven't gotten a film finance since 1999, you know, I've been having to do things on my own and, um, you know, I, I still am, uh, hired, uh, to do, to work as an actor, but, uh, I'm not sure if, whether it's just that they don't get it or they don't see the commercial viability of it or if it's something that truly offends them. I don't know. You, the, the, no, no one is going to be flat out honest with you about that kind of thing. They're not going to say, we're not going to do that because it offends us. They're going to say, well, we just don't, you know, we just don't think it's going to have an audience. Right. And so then you're, you know, when you're self finance, uh, you, you have to kind of look and try to create that audience for yourself. And part of the reason I'm here, part of the reason I'm trying to figure out a way to get this out there uh, with Patreon. Um, I'm excited by it. I'm excited by the possibilities of, of, of what's beyond this and, and how to uh, use the Patreon um, channel as, as a way to uh, put out things that I have had in on the shelf for years. I've got, incredible interviews with uh, Kurt Vonnegut and um, Gore Vidal and Norman Mailer and Howard Zinn and Johnny Cash. And are you doing Harry these Bill interviews Fonte with the Ouija board, I, Tim? What's up? <laughs> well, I, there was a, actually a documentary I was trying to get financing for many years. And uh, yes, with a Ouija board, I, I did them years ago. And uh, you know, there's this thing called, <laughs> there's this thing called tape and uh, you can keep things forever with tape uh before we let you before we let you go though could you just talk a little bit about the uh the cast that you have for babo supreme because you got some you got some god level actors to, to join you on this little endeavor here and i was wondering how you went about casting it and uh working with them guys like ray wise and ted levine two favorites of ours here oh so genius uh well ray ray wise and jack black who are both in babo supreme were all, were in the original bob roberts um uh and i um have kept up correspondence with them over the years and Jack's been a friend for many years. Um, and Ted Levine is in it. Uh, I, uh, worked with him recently on a TV project, uh, Isla Fisher, oh, um, right. uh, plays, uh, the wife of Baba Supreme called Mabu. Um, we have, uh, Haley Joel Osment, um, Pat Oswalt, uh, Ricky Lindholm, uh, Rita Brent, um, 
Sashir Zameda, uh, this is just an incredible group of, uh, oh, Alfre Woodard uh, plays uh, Alton Pure, uh, um, the uh, socialist candidate. Incredible um, talent, and I was humbled by the idea that they would do it. Um, they all jumped on board with enthusiasm, and uh, um, I, I think you uh, give it a listen. It's I, I think it's uh, I'd love for people to 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 hear it. I think here's the other thing. I think it's super important right now um, with the amount of doom scrolling we do and and the amount of negativity coming out in the news every night. We need humor. We need to laugh. We need laughter is power. It's, it's something that can be a band aid or a, a medicine for us uh, in times like this. Uh, for me, it's uh, an effective uh, and powerful tool to, uh, uh, to expose uh, hypocrisy. And laughter allows us uh, to gain or regain part of our humanity. Uh, because uh, the, 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 the worst thing that could happen is that this guy's living in our head all the time and we become him. We become that id. We, we let our own ids become unchecked. And we become what we have been opposing and laughter and entertainment and music and uh, good films can help us get through this mess. I mean, yeah, people talk about uh, about humor or political humor like it's, you know, like 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 a sword to, to puncture the, the, the egos and the, the the pomposity of these these awful evil people. But, you know, I mean, it's also a shield to keep them out of your head. And to like keep your yeah, like you said, like keep your own sense of self and and you know humanity and not be dragged. I mean, it's just like to to, to just sort of uh, to, to suffer the uh, without humor, you can't. It just it all it all just goes straight through you, and you know it just it seeps into your pores. Like and you know so like humor is a way to, like I said, deflect um, the all of their all of the many many ways that we are just continue to be demoralized day in and day out. It also reminds us of what something that we're sorely missing right now is, which is the community, the sense of community, the gathering place, the place to go with others, to know that we're still sane, the, 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 the concert hall or the theater or the movie theater where we can experience emotions from characters, stories that reflect our lives that with other people that remind us of a shared humanity and hopefully comedy can do that, even though we might be isolated. We know that we're not the only ones laughing. We're not the only ones that feel this way. We're not alone in this. It does uh, hold the possibility of reminding us of what it was like to be able to sit in a, a room with other people and laugh together and feel things together and have a collective anger together. One day soon, next year in Jerusalem, we will all be watching Christopher Nolan's Tenet on IMAX 3D. <laughs> uh, Tim Robbins, I want to thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, the, the new podcast slash radio play is Babo Supreme, available on Patreon. Tim, thanks a lot. Thank you, and thank you for sharing Patreon with me. I, I swear I won't get in your shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better not. That's all we have to do.